Now in the last couple of weeks we've had a, a lot of activity in our congregation. I mean the announcement sheet gets longer and longer and longer. You know, 75th anniversary service, all those great things that were taking place on that day. So many people and guests that were here honoring one of our uh, elders and his wife, and then the big uh, ladies retreat, probably the best attended one that we uh, have uh, organized. That was taking place, the church picnic. I think somebody told me we had close to 300 people that went to the church picnic. So many people involved in that particular um, uh, project. The summer series, we just finished uh, uh, last week and we've had uh, excellent speakers uh, every single week, 13 different speakers to come and edify us. Men's breakfast coming up this uh, Saturday, Bible classes, new Bible classes starting this Sunday, the new quarter begins, brand new classes, we'll have four adult classes that we are offering. I mean, it just goes on and on. Marty mentioned uh, Blake uh, Butler being baptized on Sunday night. What a great young man he is. What a marvelous uh, story, so full of faith and sincerity. Just, uh, you know, just a little aside, when everything is going on and lots of busyness and stuff like that, I'm always happy and I'm always hoping, you know, I'm praying, Lord, I hope all these things, this fellowship, this activity, this work, I hope it's pleasing to you. But when someone is baptized, that's almost like the Holy Spirit saying, good job, Choctaw, good job. I'm going to add someone to the church. I'm going to add someone to the church. And so we've been really, really blessed. The, uh, the calendar is packed with activities and events that'll keep us busy all the way to, uh, all the way till Christmas. I always tell people, if you're going to plan something, you better go to the office and check the calendar because uh, uh, all the days are, are taken up. So, these fellowship and service events you know, are enjoyable, they're edifying, but I want us to remember something. I want us to remember that they are not the goal or the purpose of our Christianity. You know, we get caught up in deadlines and preparation and organization, but we need to remember this is not the goal. These things that we do, they're the means, they're the ways that we keep our faith strong and growing. They're not an end to themselves, they're a means to an end. The goal of our lives in Christ is to become and to remain faithful disciples. That's the goal, that's the end game, that we remain faithful to Jesus Christ. This other stuff that we do, that we plan, that we organize, are simply serving that, that goal. They help us to grow and they help us to develop as disciples of Jesus Christ. Now in Luke chapter 14 verses 25 to 35, Jesus Himself goes more deeply into not just the service and edification elements of discipleship, but He also addresses the sacrifices often required of one who chooses to follow Jesus. So I want us to read Luke chapter 14 beginning in verse 25. Jesus says the following, or the text says the following. Now large, uh, uh, 14, uh, 14, that's it. It says, now large crowds were going along with him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all, he, all of his own possessions. Therefore, salt is good, but even if salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless, either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
Now an interesting idea here, a point about this particular passage, is that these verses were spoken by Jesus at the height of His popularity. He was very, very popular when He said these things. Luke says uh, in verse 25 that great multitudes were going along with Him. Verse 25. In other words, wherever He went, there were crowds. Uh, uh, wherever He was, there were signs and miracles, there were teaching unlike any that people uh, had ever heard. There was excitement. And I was thinking, as I was reading this, I was thinking in the paper, you know, recently the actor George Clooney got married and they showed him and his new bride you know, walking into one place. Or, you know, and everywhere they went, there were people with taking pictures and crowds following them. And I was thinking, that must have been what it was like with Jesus, of course, for different reasons, but always people around him, people wanting to be near him, to see him. He was a star, he was, he was uh, uh, an individual that created excitement, true excitement, uh, when he was with uh, people. And so being with him was exciting. You know, they, they, George Clooney, they had the list of in, those who were invited to his wedding. You know, and it was, the, it was the invitation of the season. Everybody wanted to be at that wedding in Venice. You know, the biggest Hollywood star, all the A-lists were there for that particular event. Well, in a way, it was like that with Jesus as well. Being with Him was exciting, rewarding. It was, it was easy to fall into the trap of thinking that being His disciple meant simply to follow the crowd and observe each day's event. Wow, I wonder what's going to happen today. I wonder what exciting thing is going to take place today as we, as we follow along, because I'm His disciple. I was there when He multiplied the bread and I was there when He healed this person. I mean, you need to come along with us. So Jesus at this moment here was on the verge of His most spectacular public event. And that event would be the triumphal entry into Jerusalem with the crowds chanting His name and singing His praises. And I suppose that it was for this reason that on the eve of this great moment, when He was set to have the entire population declare Him king, that He chose to establish the litmus test for discipleship. I mean, when you're extremely, you know, he does exactly the opposite thing that people do. When people become, you know, when they're not well known, they'll just say anything. They'll shoot from the hip, you know, and so on and so forth. But then as they become well known and popular and they want to keep their fame, they begin being very careful in what they say so that they can hang on to their popularity. They don't want to offend anybody. Jesus does exactly the opposite. When he's on the verge of his greatest moment, the most people focusing on Him, what does He do? He establishes the test for being His disciple. Everyone who followed and heard and saw began to claim discipleship around Him. They wanted to be with a winner. But Jesus presents a sobering challenge to those who truly would follow Him. And so in this passage he tells them that in, he tells them in no uncertain terms that to be His disciples they have to place Him above all else. And he explains what placing Him above all else means in very practical terms. First of all he says that being above all else means that the disciples that follow Him have to love Him more than any other person they know. I mean, He even mentions some of the closest and most important relationships that a person can have, parents, spouse, children. And He says that we should hate these people if they try to stop us from putting Him above everything, even themselves. Not the type of thing that a person currying favor would say, don't you think? Jesus demands that His disciples even place their own lives below their love for Him. Now you ask yourself, is this, is this a parable or is it in the realm of possibility? 
You know what I'm saying? Is it, is it just a kind of a hyperbole? You know what I'm saying? An exaggeration. You got to love me more than your mom or dad or child or wife or husband. You know, more than your own. Is he just exaggerating to make a point? Is it just a parable? No. No. Because we see examples of people who did exactly this in the Bible. You know, look, 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 look at the people in the Bible who claim to be disciples, if you wish, believers, sincere followers of God. You know, Gideon, in the Old Testament, went against his own father in tearing down pagan altars in order to respect and obey God. Abraham was ready to sacrifice his only son in response to God's command, Genesis 22. Paul the Apostle willingly gave up his life in martyrdom in order to do what? To further the cause of Christ, 2 Timothy 4.6. The Hebrew writer speaks of countless women and men who gave up their families and their very own lives in order to remain true to God and His promises in that marvelous passage, Hebrews 11, 32 to 40. And so discipleship, Jesus is saying, is, is a two-way street. Jesus gives up His life for us and we give up our life for Him. Discipleship means more than just observing Jesus doing what He does. It's more than just talking about Him and what He has said and done. It requires us to make Him the being who is above every other being in our lives, including ourselves. That's discipleship. Above all else also means being ready to suffer. You know, in verse 27, what does he say? Uh, what does he say? Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Can't, you can't, he said. You can't do it. You can't do it. You know, I, I saw a sign once that summarized this idea rather well. It said, uh, Jesus didn't say that it would be easy. He said it would be worth it. Not the same thing. Becoming a Christian is no guarantee of a better life in this world. It is, however, a guarantee of an eternal life in the world to come. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells His disciples that the only guarantee for this life is that you will have a cross to bear. That's the only promise. I don't promise you wealth or health or an easy time. I don't promise any of that. The only thing I promise you that you will have as my disciple is in some way you will have a cross to bear. You know, uh, 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 some people think that this passage is mysterious or hard to understand, but those who are disciples, you know, for them it, it, it's quite clear. The cross that you carry is the suffering that you must endure to follow Jesus. That's the cross that you, that's the cross that you carry. From the very beginning, there was always a price to pay in order to be a disciple of Jesus. And you know what? It's different for every single person sitting here tonight. It's different from me than it is for you. It's different for, for everybody. For some it has meant persecution and martyrdom. You know, those are the famous ones, the big lights. But for many it has meant isolation from an unbelieving family or rejection from friends or society. And for everybody, it's meant the daily struggle to do what the Lord has taught rather than to give in to the flesh or go along with what's easy or what's popular. Every single day you feel the pressing of the cross on you. And it's, always not, it's not always some sort of dramatic thing that other people can notice. Maybe what you fight is depression. Maybe what you fight is lust, 
Maybe what you, maybe your cross to bear is that compared to other people, it's easy for you to drink, it's easy for you to smoke, it's easy for you to kind of drown out the world by, by taking something in. It's easy for you to do whatever against God's will. But every single person, everyone, has some kind of cross that they have to bear. It's the guarantee of discipleship. So putting Jesus above all automatically means that one will suffer consequences sooner or later because of that, because of that decision. You know, Jesus requires disciples not to be surprised or discouraged or impatient with the cross bearing required by those who put Him above all else. So when you become a Christian, or when you decide to become a better Christian or a more faithful Christian, or when you commit yourself, Lord, I'm sticking with this to the end, realize that all of a sudden that cross gets a little heavier. <laughs> if your prayer to the Lord saying to Him, Lord, I'm yours, you know I'm yours, you know I love you, if you think by saying that that the burden is going to get lighter, it's, it's exactly the opposite. He shows you who you really are. And that in itself is a great burden. Of course, we also know who He really is. And that's the ultimate salvation and that's the ultimate way that we can bear the burden. That's how spiritual things work. That's how things are connected. And then all else or above all else, putting Jesus above all else requires counting the cost of discipleship. I read again you know, that patent 28 where he says, for which one of you when he wants to build a tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it and he goes on there. He gives two parables in order to drive this point home. One, a man fails to complete the building of a tower because he didn't take the time to calculate the total cost. Not the initial cost, the total cost. His work is incomplete because of this and he's ridiculed by those who observe his failure. That's one parable. And the other parable is a king who considers his options when facing another king in battle and, 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 and the decision whether to fight or negotiate based on the size of the enemy and the chance of victory. Now the point here is that neither one had what it took to achieve the task and should have looked ahead before even taking the first step. The warning is that we better carefully examine what Jesus requires of His disciples before we even start, because the cost is very high and not everyone understands that what He requires of us is everything. And the problem usually is, I mean, that's how it is in my life, the problem usually is that there are some things we just want to hang on to. We just want to keep them because we like them, whatever they are. Whether they're coping mechanisms or weaknesses or whatever they are. Lusts, little things that we indulge in. You know. We want to hang on to these. We're ready to do the rest. Some are ready to work extra hard in serving the Lord in one area and they think somehow by working extra hard in this area gives them the right to hang on to this little secret sin over here, but they don't get it. The process of discipleship is the process of getting rid of everything that belongs to us. You know, a man called Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, a Lutheran priest in Germany during World War II and he was in the minority, he spoke out against Hitler, Nazism, the injustice, the evil of it, and was quickly put into prison where he died for his trouble. The thought being, wow, I spoke up, now I'm in jail, rotting in jail. Maybe I should have said nothing. Maybe I shouldn't have spoken truth to power. Maybe I shouldn't have listened to what my conscience and my spirit told me that I must do. Perhaps I could have done better you know, being out there and helping and so on and so forth. Except while Dietrich Bonhoeffer was rotting away in a jail, he wrote this book called 
The Cost of Discipleship. And it is a classic book. It is the go-to book on the subject of discipleship. Oh, the deep insights that Bonhoeffer offers to us concerning what it means to follow Jesus. In this book he says the following, when Jesus calls a man, he calls him to die. When Jesus calls a man, he calls him to die. Die to what? He calls him to die to self, calls him to die to the world. Jesus says that you must be willing to give up all that you possess, verse 33. And He means all, including our goals, our loves, our lives, in exchange for His goals and His love and His life. So it doesn't mean you know, we empty ourselves and we're just empty shells and nothing, no. It's the process of emptying self so that Jesus Christ can fill us with Himself. And so in verse 34 and 35, the Lord finishes up His warning by reminding them that what gives salt its value is not its appearance or its name, but its taste, its power to affect other substances. In the same way, the value of discipleship is that disciples are exclusively dedicated to Christ above all else. We can be dedicated at work, of course we can be. And we can be committed to our families, of course we are. And we can even be focused and involved in, in activities, sports, you know, yes, we live in, in the world. But discipleship means that Jesus Christ comes above these things. We don't eliminate these things, we simply put them in their proper order with Christ at the top. In the same way, the value of our discipleship is that disciples are exclusively dedicated to Christ above all else because this is what gives them the power to influence the world and glorify Christ and confirm the genuineness of our faith. You know, we've forgotten the name of all the big shots in the Nazi uh, 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 organization. And there were many self-important men there that, that had uh, the power of life and death, but we don't even remember who they are. But we do remember the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and what he said about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. You know, if disciples don't put Christ above all else, Jesus says, they're like salt without taste. Christians in name only, but without the power to affect others for Christ. Useless in this world, useless in the next as well. Well, some people say that you know, um, they don't see where an invitation is part of a sermon or a lesson. Like on a Wednesday night, you know, why, why should we have that? But if you look at verse 35b, Jesus makes His invitation to His audience and He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's His invitation. In other words, if you understand what I'm saying, then pay attention and do something about it. The invitation is the very same today as it was then and it's for the same reason, even though we're in Choctaw, America and we're not in Nazareth or Jerusalem, we are growing here in this church. And it's a good time to be a Christian, isn't it? I mean, we have freedom to worship in our congregation, lots of family activities, the church has harmony. We kind of focused on that in our 75th anniversary. What a great thing, 75 years of, 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 of a church being united, marvelous. And, and, and many services you know, for children, for widows, for you know, the youth group. You know, we, we serve in a lot of different ways here. But let's not allow the image of easy Christianity to fool us. Jesus still requires disciples to put Him above all else today, even as He required His own disciples to do it while He was alive. 
And let's remember that discipleship still demands the very same thing as it always has. Jesus above everyone and everything in your life. A readiness to follow despite the suffering or the lure of this world. And a calculated understanding that following the Lord may cost you everything you have, including your life. You know, Marty and I, you know, we, we, we often talk uh, about the church. That's all we talk about actually is the church. <laughs> but sometimes you know, we dream a little bit. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be wonderful? You know, we think, wow, wouldn't it be great if every single pew from front to back were filled with people every Sunday, not just Sunday morning, but Sunday night, Wednesday night. You know, wouldn't it be great if that happened? And I think that's a good dream. You know, I, that's a great dream. Why not have more people praising God? Absolutely. But let's not only be interested in filling the pews with bodies. I personally, and I don't usually speak for Marty, but I'm pretty sure this is how he thinks as well. We also want the pews to be filled with disciples who put Jesus above all else. God is not honored by a building full of half-hearted disciples. So I ask you, in the spirit of the invitation, if you're one of those who knows Jesus, but you've not properly obeyed Him, in other words, you've been following the crowd and you've been observing what He does, but you have not yourself obeyed His command to repent and be baptized, then you need to think on the things that I've spoken about tonight before you come forward. And if you're one of those you know, lukewarm disciples who have Jesus you know, well contained in your life so that He will not cause you to be disturbed or distracted from your comfort, from your life in this world, you, know, you got Him under control, perhaps now is the time to assess the true character of your relationship with Him. And if you think I'm referring to you, well, maybe I am. You'll have to decide that. So please, do something about your discipleship right now. Do whatever it takes to put Jesus above all else. And we do offer the invitation. We don't usually do it on a Wednesday night, but I asked Bob to pick a song so that we could extend an invitation for anyone here who needs to either obey the gospel, require prayer to be a more faithful and fruitful disciple or whatever, whatever you might need, then we encourage you, let's stand up, let's sing that song of invitation, and if you need to respond, please do so now.